Jaron Jarvis Channel, Top 20 Scary Stories of the Day from Reddit No Sleep. 2018-09-04. Story 1, Missing. I haven't seen my husband in weeks. His schedule has been horrible lately, he's been pulling 12 and 13 hour shifts. That's not including the time it takes him to drive to and from his job site, which is another hour and a half to two hours each way. By the time he gets home at night, I'm already in bed, and he's gone before the sun rises. His boss has a strict no cell phone policy, so he can't really call me during the day. I bought him a Bluetooth headset last Christmas so we could talk while he was driving, but it stopped working a month ago. I know it's not his fault, but I miss him. Sometimes I'll feel him climb into bed and wrap his arms around me, and I fall asleep knowing I'm safe in his arms. He's gone when I wake up, but he always leaves the porch light on so I know he was home. This morning I heard him getting ready for work. I woke up to find him standing over me, gently brushing stray hairs off my forehead. The lights were off, so all I could see was his silhouette. He leaned over and kissed me on the temple I love you, I said. He responded with another kiss on my neck. Soon, he whispered. I knew what he meant. Soon his work schedule would be back to normal, then we could spend real time together again. Then he was gone, and I quickly fell asleep. When I woke up I had a text from him. It read, Good morning beautiful. Can't wait for tonight. I grinned at it. He had always been so sweet. I sent a heart back to him, and started to get ready for work. The day passed normally. I received a few texts from my husband, most said the said thing, I'm excited for tonight. I was getting excited, too. Maybe he was getting off early and we could actually have dinner together. I made it through the day and headed home, a grin on my face. I was making dinner when I heard a knock at the door. I figured it was probably a solicitor or something, so I opened it to tell them I'm not interested. Instead of a salesman or a girl scout, I came face to face with a tall, stern-looking police officer. Good evening ma'am, are you Mrs. Norrington? Yes. How can I help you, officer? He flashed his badge at me. I'm Officer Marcus. May I come in? It's about your husband. My heart began to beat faster, thumping against my ribs. My husband? Of course, come in. I stepped aside and he took off his hat as he entered. Is there a problem? Is there somewhere we can sit? I ushered him into the living room. The TV was still on, showing a rerun of Modern Family. I switched it off and sat down in one of the armchairs. Officer Marcus sat across from me. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, he started, as I struggled to breathe. We found your husband's car, abandoned on the side of Highway 95. My hand, shaking violently, fluttered up to cover my mouth. Highway 95 was the one my husband took to work every day. He, he wasn't inside? I asked, my voice muffled against my hand no, ma'am. We found him lying about a quarter of a mile away. His keys, wallet and cell phone were missing. I'm very sorry, but he's dead. Everything went dark, and I heard myself talking as if from far away. What? No. How? We're not sure yet, Officer Marcus said. He's being transported to the coroner now. But ma'am, why is it you never reported him missing? Missing? Why would I? I saw him just this morning, barely twelve hours ago. What he said next made my blood run cold. I'm still trying to process the information. It doesn't make any sense ma'am, he said, in a tone usually reserved for elderly relatives. Your husband has been dead for three weeks. Story 2, today's the 20th anniversary of Billy's disappearance. There are dark, dense woods in my hometown that were the location of a series of police investigations when I was a child. I never told anybody what I experienced there aside from the very abbreviated version I told the police 20 years ago today. I need to write what happened on September 3rd of 1998 in Walpole, New Hampshire in the hopes that it might finally fade from my memory. My best friend Billy and I were always getting into trouble. We'd raid the thrift store drop-off boxes for electronics and CDs, we'd shoplift candy from the dollar store and run like the devil when chased. 
we were delinquents, both with single mothers and the destined to fail mentality of knowing we weren't getting a shot at college. We were the have nots, and we were fine with that. Just before the first day of school, Billy called my house phone and told me to come over, and to bring a flashlight. He lived just a 12 minute walk away, so I headed out after grabbing the red plastic ever ready from the garage. I soon climbed his small house's creaking wooden steps and knocked on the screen door. Billy opened it beaming a wide, mischievous smile under his long, greasy hair. He motioned for me to enter with an arm that looked comically skinny in an oversized Judas Priest t-shirt, clearly his older brother's. He led me to the ratty, plaid couch that stank like cigarettes and spilled beer, and we both sat as he looked up at me with focused hazel eyes that beamed with excitement over his freckled cheeks. He clearly had a big fat secret to tell me come on out with it, what's up? I finally asked. Remember Sarah Benton from third grade? He asked with a sly smile yeah remember how she went missing the last week of school? Yeah, so? Sarah Benton with the $20,000 reward for her whereabouts? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, just spill it, I huffed I found her backpack bullshit I replied, but Billy just nodded his head slowly without breaking eye contact. He reached behind the ratty old couch and pulled up a green backpack. It was filthy and stained and it stunk like mildew. I felt nauseated watching as small worms and bill bugs squirmed along the zipper of the smaller pocket, and I knew before even seeing the cursive name tag that reads error, it was really hers. She'd gone missing after chasing after her dog that ran into the forest. The whole town had searched for weeks, but nothing was ever found. It was a year later and we all knew she was dead, but this was the first actual lead. Holy shit, where did you find that? I asked. Feeling the buzz of excitement at the mystery of the woods near Mr. Peter's place, Billy said with a conviction that worried me, we're going to go get that reward, today. Billy stood up then entered his brother's room. He returned after a few minutes holding two walkie-talkies, and he tossed one to me. I nearly dropped it, surprised by the weight. Just in case, Billy said, and I just nodded, attempting to appear brave in front of my best friend. I'd seen the dozens of missing posters over the year with that big, bold reward on them. I knew that $20,000 would go a long way. We soon were off, walking on the side of the road and talking about game systems and sneakers we'd spend the money on. We veered closer to the drainage ditch when the occasional truck zoomed past, spraying asphalt and chugging out black smoke. No more than 15 minutes later, we'd arrived at the barbed wire fence, covered with those bright orange no trespassing and no hunting signs. I followed Billy as we slipped between the barbed wire and we entered the thick woods. It was far too quiet and dark in that forest. It was a sunny day around 3 p.m., but it looked like dusk in the immense shade the tall trees provided, it was uncanny. I could barely see any gaps in the many layered leaves of the canopy, nearly all outside light was blocked out, and I felt the temperature had dropped at least 10 degrees upon entering here, Billy's voice called out, this is where I spotted it after a deer jumped the fence. Billy switched on his flashlight and pointed it at a patch of exposed dirt wriggling with worms and beetles. The patch sat just before an archway of low bending trees that continued into darkness. I wanted to turn back, but something powerful tugged at my curiosity to the point I couldn't even look away from the black void ahead. It was hypnotic, framed like a hallway of arched branches leading into shadow she must be in there Billy spoke in a voice that muffled voice. I clenched my teeth and watched him step in, and nearly vanish before I switched my light on to see his dim form turn to face me. I could just make out the silver sheen of his eyes reflecting the cold beam of my flashlight, and soon my feet followed after him. The temperature dropped instantly upon entering. I felt the vibration in my skull as my teeth began chattering from the chill. Each step forward my flashlight's beam somehow seemed to shrink shorter in the dark path barely able to even illuminate the bending trees directly at my sides like bars on a cage. I was only a meter behind Billy, but the beam just barely illuminated his white sneakers, the rest of him cloaked in shadow before they too seemed to vanish in the blackness. Then I felt something cold and wet brush against my arm. 
I am well aware that fear and a child's imagination can present hallucinatory experiences, my shrink told me that over and over before I stopped going, but I know what is real and what isn't. I felt a bony hand wrap around my bicep and squeeze hard, causing a sharp, sudden pain. I screamed out, aiming the flashlight's impossibly short beam over, barely illuminating white, finger-like branches bending in the wind. The beam of my light reached me a feet from the bulb, and every hair on my neck stood on end as I watched the shadows drink the light up the faster than it could project. Then Billy spoke dee 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 do dee dee do you see it? Billy stuttered in an odd, wavering voice. I always had poor vision, being far-sighted. My eyes strained to focus, I actually felt something closing in based on the sound, but I saw absolutely nothing just the beam of my flashlight stopping dead on those finger-like branches that swayed in the frigid breeze see what? My voice came out of me quimper, and then I heard a branch snapping followed by that horrible laughter. It was Billy, giggling quietly at first as if he was trying to control himself but unable. His laugh grew louder and hysterical. I then felt something moving closer to my head, inches from my ear. Billy's laughter cackled and spat, rising in pitch into a shrill, explosive howl. He sounded lost in a psychotic fit, half laughing and half shrieking. Billy, I called out nervously, then shouted, Billy. There was a sudden silence. I smelled the rancid stench of death and decay and then felt a heavy breathing. My heart pounded in my chest as I raised the short beam of the weak flashlight slowly upward, and I saw Billy's contorted face, framed by his wild, matted hair in front of me as that deep vibratory breathing blew the hairs on my neck. I was paralyzed with fear, and I'll never forget Billy's twisted expression as he stared at whatever stood over me. His eyes were wide, unfeeling and somehow, changed, as if washed in ink. His drooling mouth hung agape in a hideous grimace like a large wound, bending his jaw. Both his mouth and eyes stretched wider and wider until I could hear the tendons creak and wet pops of the tearing muscles within his jaw. His shaking right hand reached down slowly then grabbed his left wrist. D do you see it? He asked in a drawn out way that would haunt me for decades. His fingers clenched tightly on his arm, dripping red as from where his fingernails punctured the skin. I watched in reeling horror as he then snapped his forearm down at a 90 degrees angle, accompanied with that grotesque, loud crack of the bones. I stumbled in shock, nearly falling. His screaming laughter brimmed with absolute insanity as he then inserted his fingers deep into his eye sockets, gouging the plump orbs out as if to remove what they'd witnessed. I heard a low clicking as something large and very long moved past me on my left, and the fuzzy shadows erased Billy from visibility before meaty ripping sounds joined his shrieking laughter. I ran back through the dense darkness, unable to tell which direction I was heading. I couldn't see anything, but I heard those deep, buzzing clicks just behind me as I ran. I sprinted faster than I'd ever run in my life until the beam became brighter and the faint details of the trees at my side came back into view. I finally exited that tunnel of those limb-like branches, hearing the scuttling of multiple sets of quick feet following close behind me. I didn't stop running until I was back at the barbed wire fence. I screamed out to Billy until my throat was raw and hoarse. I repeatedly tried the walkie-talkie, but only heard static. After nearly an hour, I ran home with salty tears streaming down my face. I sprinted into my house, telling my mom to call the police, that Billy was missing in the woods by Mr. Peter's place and someone or something had taken him. The responding officers questioned me about the thin, branch-like bruises on my arms before conducting a thorough search of those dense woods over the following week. They found his walkie and flashlight crawling with beetles, but nothing else. Neither Billy nor Sarah were ever found. Every night for twenty years that horrible laughter has echoed in my memory, and every night I've prayed they never are. Dot story 3, I sell mystery boxes on the deep web. I started doing it on a whim. My brother has an unhealthy obsession with online vloggers. I can barely go a day without him linking me to a video of someone taking part in some sort of challenge or performing some social experiment. So, when the whole deep web mystery box trend started, I was one of the first to know. 
My brother must have sent me dozens of videos of annoying preteens opening up boxes filled with junk that they tried to pass off as creepy and sinister. When my brother asked me for my opinion, I told him that it combined all the boredom of an unboxing video with all the stupidity of the Tide Pod challenge. I added that most of them were probably making the boxes themselves. Even I could do it. And that's when the wheels started turning. A quick search confirmed that this was a growing trend, with hundreds of people claiming to have opened up boxes containing everything from drugs to murder weapons to mysterious flash drives. Some vloggers even claimed that they had spent thousands of dollars on a single mystery box. Those were obviously fake, but what about the rest? Were there really people out there who would spend at least a hundred dollars for the chance to go viral? I bet that they would and, unfortunately, I was right. Putting the boxes together was easier than expected. I had some cardboard boxes stuffed in my closet that turned out to be the perfect size for the job. Some rusty screwdrivers proved perfect as my murder weapons. My desk drawer offered up a surprising number of old flash drives that I made mystery box ready by filling them with as many creepy videos as I could download. Finally, some expired sinus tablets provided me with some mysterious deep web drugs once I had peeled the labels off. Getting the website set up on the deep web was a little harder, but you can find an online tutorial for anything these days. By the time I was ready to go to bed, I was the proud owner of the Emporium of Mysteries. For $50 worth of Bitcoin, anyone could be the proud owner of a mystery box. Sure, the site looked like it had come straight out of the early 90s, but it was good enough. I was in business. The next morning I went looking for customers. Fortunately, my brother's messages had made me very familiar with the online vlogging community. I messaged a few of the smaller channels with some burner accounts I made and left a few comments on their latest videos. You should do a deep web unboxing video. You know what would be really cool? Unboxing something from the deep web. I'd bet you'd get millions of views. I heard about this new place on the deep web called the Emporium of Mysteries. They sell mystery boxes there. You should check them out. Then all I had to do was sit back and wait. By the end of the day, I had six purchases. Not much all put together, but enough to help put food on the table. By the end of the afternoon, I had the boxes ready to ship. I wasn't looking to scam these people after all. They got to make their stupid videos, and I got to eat. Everybody was happy. I sold a few more over the next few weeks, but eventually, interest died down. Life went on. My brother sent me more stupid videos, and I gradually forgot about my time as a deep web merchant. Until last Friday. When I got home from work there was a package waiting for me outside my apartment door. When I picked it up and examined it, I realized that it was one of my mystery boxes. It looked like I had an unhappy customer, but it wasn't like they were getting their money back. I took it inside and opened it up. It was empty save for a flash drive that I didn't recognize. I was curious what was on it, but I wasn't about to let some disgruntled hacker infect my computer, so I dug out an old laptop that I hardly used anymore and plugged it in. It was full of pictures. Pictures of my hometown, of my apartment, of me. Whoever sent me this had been following me, had been inside my home. Staring at those pictures I started to realize just how out of my depth I was. You see not everything you find on the deep web is fake. There are some people out there who do sell real mystery boxes. And they are tired of scammers like me taking away from their profits. Thankfully, they are very generous people and want to give me a second chance. So, I am pleased to announce that the Emporium of Mysteries is under new management. Now, for the same low price, you will receive a genuine mystery box. It will include a special tool from my new partner's personal collection, along with a video instructing you in its use, co-starring myself. The body part or organ extracted during the video will also be included as a special memento. Supplies are limited, so search us out on the deep web as soon as possible. We look forward to your business. Story 4, I found a missing persons report on my brother, he was never missing. I've been volunteering at my dad's police station after school. Since my mom died I want to spend as much time away from home as I can. I don't get paid much but it keeps me busy, 
All I have to do is file reports and file the write-ups on the missing people around our state. My dad is the lead detective at the precinct so he sometimes lets me answer the phones in between shifts. It's really cooling pretending to be a detective. Until you find something that clearly makes no sense. About three days ago I was working in my dad's office filling paperwork on missing persons from 2012. I never look in the files, I just look at the last name and file. Until I saw a name that sent a shiver down my spine. Levi Davis Rayland. That's my eight-year-old brother's full name. I thought at first maybe I had read the name wrong but as I looked over my shoulder to make sure my dad wasn't back yet I opened the file. On the front page paper clipped to the manila folder was a picture of my brother he would have been about two years old in the picture. On the opposite side the write-up read as this, Levi Davis Rayland. Age 2 of Shreveport. Louisiana was reported missing by his father at 12.36 p.m. Friday, July 3, 2012. Reported to be wearing a Spider-Man t-shirt, jean shorts, and Nikes. Levi was last seen in the backyard of their country home playing with his sister Lydia J. Drayland, 10. Levi has dark brown curly hair, green eyes, he is 3 feet 3 inches and weighs about 35 pounds. Please contact Shreveport Police Department if you have any information on this matter. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My brother had never been missing. Not ever. He's never even stayed away at a friend's house before. How could someone get confused on the identity of a missing person? And why does it say my dad reported him missing? None of it made any sense. I had seen Levi this morning. He was completely real. I heard my dad's voice from down the hallway and had to quickly shut the file and put it in my backpack. I'm not sure where this all came from or if maybe it was a mix-up or some sick joke that my dad's detectives are playing on me. They had so much information. Everything they said about Levi was true in 2012. His hair is still curly with those beautiful bright green eyes. I think I would know if my brother was missing for six years. Wouldn't I? This isn't something you miss. I know my dad wouldn't have missed this at all. And mom, she was alive then, she never said anything about Levi being reported missing. None of this makes sense. I'm going to try and do some research when I get home. I will keep you guys updated to the best of my ability. I'm hoping that maybe this is some sick joke and it will all be resolved. Levi is still home. As if he never left us. Story 5, Night of the Dullahan, A Halloween Tale. This is a good story. Just needs a few fixes where the names are mixed up. Story 6, I'm a swordsman in Florida, and I've seen some things. Hey, there. My name is Al, and I've had the good fortune of being born and raised in Florida. America's Wang has a lot of weird and flexible laws, and I was able to forge a lucrative career as a swordsman because of them. I get asked a lot of questions, so I'll cover the big ones here so that there's no confusion down the line. The open carry law here in Florida allows one to carry a bladed weapon as long as it is sheathed and visible, meaning that the size of the blade is irrelevant. Because of this, I am able to walk down the street with a pair of long swords strapped to my back, as long as I'm avoiding obvious things like schools and hospitals. You'll notice by the things I do and the equipment I carry that I am, in essence, a witcher. To the uninformed, a witcher is a monster hunter from the books of Andrzej Sapkowski and the video games by CD Projekt Red. I do go by this job description, but more often than not I simply say that I am a swordsman. I carry a steel sword and a specially designed silver sword in custom-made sheaths on my back. The sheaths have a cut out along the side that allows me to draw either blade quickly and easily, and replace it just the same. Carrying the swords on my back was easier, since the combat style I developed involves a lot of footwork, which isn't possible with a scab but noisily slapping at my leg. I worked for a flat fee, and I had my clients sign a contract that would remove any liability from them and ensure complete discretion until the job was done. This meant that any wounds I sustain are my problem, and if I get eaten out in the woods, my client is not responsible. I took on a variety of common and, at times, supernatural work. This meant I would be hired to find missing people, and at the same time, would be asked to break a curse. Living in Florida, weird things happen, 
and the authorities aren't always going to believe the first call someone gets about ghosts and gribblies waiting in the woods. That's where I come in, for the right price, nothing is too crazy, no explanation is too extreme. My first contract was nothing overly supernatural in hindsight, but even now it makes my skin crawl. This was shortly after I posted my first flyers around town, and I was called in by a woman that believed she was possessed. I was nervous about walking around looking fresh out of Comic Con, so I didn't exactly match the description my flyers had. The woman invited me in and explained that she was constantly waking up with these sores all over her body and couldn't ever sleep a full night without convulsing into fits and waking up every few minutes. It was as if her muscles would lock up and twist into themselves. Her doctor had no idea what could possibly be going on, her conservative family begged her to allow a priest into her home, and her work life had begun to decline due to so many sick days. I investigated around her home, checking anything that could be out of the ordinary it was a newer building, and as such, the classic leaky pipes that drive people crazy explanation was out of the question. It wasn't until I had a hunch to flip her mattress over that I found out exactly what was going on. As soon as the underside of the mattress hit the light of day, millions of blood-gorged bedbugs had begun to pour out of the seams, desperately searching for a dark place to hide. After recoiling in disgust and taking a few pictures before the parasites could shelter themselves again, I had to deduce that the woman was having little more than a terrible allergic reaction to the bites of the creatures. Sure enough, after the woman had spoken to some specialists, it was just so her body reacted differently to the saliva of the insects, and that's why the sores looked unidentifiable and her muscles would contract so wildly. This one always bothers me. I was asked to clear a path in a several acre forested area located behind a new housing complex. The owners wanted to advertise luxury hiking grounds or something equally pretentious, and figured that hiring me for a one time flat rate fee was much cheaper than paying a landscaper to do it by the hour. I cleared through a good mile of foliage with a large bush machete, my mind on autopilot, and was deep enough in the woods at this point that I couldn't hear any signs of the city nearby. It was at this point that I began to feel a peculiar kind of hunger. This peculiar craving grew fast, and it wasn't just a could go for a sandwich type of hunger, but something ancient, something primal. I felt that my life was in danger unless I ate something, right then and there. This hunger hung over me like a cloud, and I could focus on nothing else. After what felt like an eternity I was able to rest free of this unaccountable peckishness, just in time to find that I was in front of a chain-link fence, brandishing my machete, not ten feet away from a terrified little girl. Her mother was rushing to her side, screaming colorful Floridian language as she shielded her daughter, threatening to call the police and demanding to know what I was doing. I made some quick excuses about landscaping, apologized for the scare and cheesed it before I had to figure out how many tasers it would take to put me down. The rest of the contract was uneventful and I finished clearing the path without incident, but that hunger was always on my mind any time I went into the woods after that. It wouldn't be until a few months later that I would figure out why I felt it. We have a lot of gators down here in Florida. They're usually peaceful beasts, more afraid of us than we are of them, but they are still predators, and some of them get to be particularly unusual sizes. Some of them found it easier to attack the common swimmer than wait days upon days by the river, hoping a deer would come close. One particular river monster was this fat dinosaur that grew to be a good solid ton in weight, and could easily wreck a small building with an errant swing of its mighty tail. This beast had killed no less than a dozen men, women and children at a secluded spring, and had no problem killing the locals that had gone after it in vengeance, including a park ranger and a police officer. After it had left no trace of an outraged father, promising to come back with the monster's head, they finally ran out of options when they hired me. I offered my services, and, because nobody knew me in that little town, nobody hesitated to accept my price. The local ranger station even made a bet that I wouldn't come back alive. My plan for taking the thing down was to spruce up a paddle board, camouflaging it with weeds and wood, making it look like a ball of junk heading down river. 
I armed myself with a particular weapon called a bang stick, which is essentially just a 12 gauge shell on the end of a steel pole. I learned from the mistakes of those that came before me hunting this beast would mean thinking like prey, hoping to catch the beast napping or otherwise indisposed. Hunting it like a predator would put me against a creature that's been killing its entire life, and was, frankly, much better at it. I spent 12 hours on that goddamn draft, and my patience was rewarded with a sleeping gator, and a nice new hole in its face. This is one of the saddest things I've had to investigate. I received a call from a father claiming that his son had gone missing. He had called the authorities, but they'd found no trace of him in the massive woodlands they called a backyard. I wasn't exactly surprised police down here are lazy, and would prefer to leave a case cold rather than get the dogs out. When I arrived, the man had begun as soft-spoken and calm as he was on the phone, but as I raked more details out of him, was he wearing anything specific? Why did he run away? Did he have someone he could go to? That he snapped. He broke down and told me that he had an argument with his son over something irrelevant, and he ran off into the forest, hoping he would die out there. The man begged me to find his son. I didn't pull out any more information than I needed from the poor man, and set out to find the boy. His trail hadn't gone cold, yet, and I could understand why the cops couldn't quite pick it up they were very subtle things, like broken branches and damp leaves among dry ones. I trailed the boy until I came to a cut off on the path where there was a scattering of wet, slippery leaves that led off down a steep ravine. Sliding down to get a closer look, I found out exactly what had happened to the kid. Let me tell you about the coyotes down here they're very cowardly animals, often choosing to flee rather than fight, but that all changes once you step into their dens. Here, they fight as ferocious as wolves. They tore the boy apart. All I found was his lower half and a tract of his intestine I could tell by the shoes. It hurt to report my findings to the father. I didn't charge him for the work. I couldn't. I once found myself in the local campgrounds. I was asked to investigate some reports that campers have been putting in by the owners of the park. Strange lights in the evening fog, markings on the trees around campsites, and the ever-present stink of rotting blood. This was the first time I had been fully equipped for a job, as this was the first time I had no true idea about what I was getting myself into. I investigated around the last campsite that had sent in a report, scantly a day ago, and I found that it did, indeed, have strange markings on all of the trees around it. They looked like a mountain lion had scored around the trees, clawing for purchase, as if swinging from base to base like a monkey. I had taken my phone out at this point to take a picture, when I had the urge to stuff my nose into my shirt due to the sudden, sour stink of blood in the air. Not knowing what else to do, I drew the German bastard sword from my back, and took a high stance, looking around frantically to figure out what was happening. It was only then that I realized there was no natural sound. The wind blew, the leaves shifted, but the crickets and cicadas had all stopped. I felt the blood in my veins with every thunderous pump of my heart. In an instant, I was lying on my stomach, wind knocked clear out of me. Struggling to my feet and catching my breath, I planted myself back first against a tree, blade ever at the ready, but at this point that stink of blood had long gone. I found out that whatever had struck me seemed to have been aiming at my spine, and if it weren't for the steel reinforced wooden sword scabbards that I had been wearing, could have hurt me a lot worse than it did. I noped out of there for the time being. That's all I have for now, to avoid this post becoming a wall of text. I'll write more later, and I hope to explain why I felt that excruciating hunger in the woods during my path clearing in my next post. Florida is a very weird state but don't ever get too comfortable down here. When the sun sets on this land, something dark rises, and not everybody is ready to deal with the things in the shadows on their own. Dot story 7, my sister won't stop singing about the child snatcher. My sister is six years old. She has just started school again after the summer holidays and over the last few days she has sung the same song over and over and I'm really starting to freak out. The song goes. Child snatcher, child snatcher beware beware the child snatcher, for if he sees you he will catch you. First he snarls and then he whacks you, 
then eventually he will detach you. Limb from limb, people will see the remains of you in their dreams. Now don't get me wrong, when I was growing up I remember reciting many of the stupid urban legends like Bloody Mary and Candyman but I swear this is different. When she sings it, she appears to be in a trance. Her voice lowers and almost slows to the point it's almost unnatural. Sometimes she makes dead eye contact with me and it doesn't break until the song is over and then she immediately goes back to whatever she was doing and her voice returns to normal. She's drawing these pictures as well. A tall man with an unnaturally long face dressed in a hooded drape, you can't see his body. He holds a huge person-sized net. Another unnerving aspect is that she only sings this song in front of me. She has never done it in front of my parents and even when I tried to show them, she just acted puzzled as if she didn't know what I was talking about. My parents just laughed at me and told me I needed an early night. I walked into my room the other night to her singing this in her sleep. She often sleep talks slash walks but I am terrified over this song. Maybe I'm being dramatic and freaking myself out but each day it gets worse. Last night I awoke to her standing in front of the window staring into the dead night and whispering this song in that voice. I'm having this reoccurring dream now as well. In the dream, my sister is alone in the dead of night in some woods that I do not recognize. She looks pale and very scared. She's walking around frantically and calling my name. I try to call out to her but it's like I'm invisible to her. After a while, a tall figure emerges from the trees and violently swats a huge net around in an attempt to catch her. I scream and cry but no one even reacts to me. I wake up to her whispering the song and staring at me dead in the eyes. I've even tried talking to her about it straight after she has an episode but she just looks at me with a terrified expression and softly shushes me. I've googled the child snatcher song but I cannot find anything even similar. I am honestly lost I do not know what to do. Can someone please just tell me I'm being stupid? I'm so worried about this, it honestly seems to be consuming her and I'm terried for her. Dot story 8, this is not my husband. This is really weird. It even feels weird to write it. But my husband has been. Missing. And the person who replaced him, is just. Different. And the weirdest thing is, I know I should know him, he feels familiar. But I don't. And I don't know why. A bit of background. I met Tom at a company Christmas party. He came with his date, Tiana. Tiana of course was tall, willowy and blonde. Big boobs, gorgeous, always had her makeup and hair perfectly styled. The room was floating around the office where that she slept her way into her current position as a manager. As a co-worker under her, I knew better. She worked hard. She would often be the last person to leave at night, and the first one there in the morning. And that was incredibly difficult, especially as she was raising two beautiful daughters at home by herself. So it was really hard for me to be jealous of her, because I knew just how hard things were on her. I went to the party by myself, of course. My date, Angelica, was my best friend from high school, and we did everything together. But, her four-year-old came down with something that evening, and of course he was vomiting, so even just putting him to bed wasn't going to work for the babysitter, so she stayed home. No problem. As long as I didn't drink too much, I'd be fine. And she was the one who usually regulated my drinking, but I could totally keep myself from going overboard. Or so I thought. Halfway through the night, I was loaded. Hammered. Completely smashed. I was dancing it up on the dance floor, having a blast. I danced with everyone, guys, girls, even the non-binary person from accounting. I still wasn't sure what gender to call them, so I just called them Chase. It was their name, after all. After a particularly fun dance-off between myself and a couple of others, dancing to YMCA, of course, I found myself needing to use the facilities. Wandering drunkenly over to the bathrooms, I tripped on nothing at all and landed on my hands and knees. It hurt, but not too bad. I sat down, looked at my bruised palms, and giggled a bit. A shadow passed over me and I looked up into the greenest eyes I've ever seen. You okay? 
A smile that could generate enough power to light up most of Ontario was the second thing I saw, and I nodded quickly, a blush of embarrassment covering my face from neck to hairline. Scrambling up, I nearly lost it when he reached out to help me. I'm okay, I think, I blurted, sounding like the biggest fool in the world. And suddenly, I felt nearly stone cold sober. Just a hint of alcohol still ran through my veins, but with his hands on my arms, holding me gently, I felt as though I belonged there. I had never met this man in my life, but the urge to lean forward and kiss him was so strong that it took me a few seconds to realize that doing that would be a mistake. Not only because he had come with my direct manager, and I didn't know if they were together, but also because he could be anybody at all, and I wouldn't know until it was too late. His kind eyes made me feel like he wouldn't hurt me, but I had been wrong about people before, and I wasn't about to be hurt again. Another quick smile and a repeated I'm okay, and I ducked my head, and raced into the bathroom. When I came out, I really was sober, and decided to call it a night. I headed for the front doors, grabbing my coat check ticket from out of my shoe. I hadn't brought a purse. As I was about to put my coat on, warm hands gently pulled it from me, and held it for me so I could put it on. His gentle gaze surprised me again, and I smiled as he helped me into my coat. My blush was back, and I felt it creeping all the way down to my chest. Leaving so soon? He asked intently. I'd never had someone so focused on me before, never thought anyone would have been so interested. I'm not ugly, I guess, but very plain, especially as he had come with Tiana. I figure I've had quite enough of being the entertainment for the evening, I giggled, still very embarrassed about my fall. I pulled the bobby pins from my shoulder-length brown hair, letting it fall where it wanted. I wasn't trying to be sexy, I just really wanted my hair down. The bobby pins were really tight, and releasing them just felt so good. His gaze wandered over my hair, and he slowly reached out and caressed it. He ran his fingers through my hair, and watched as the light played over the strands. Wow, he whispered. I blushed again. He made me feel like I was the only person in the world. He wrenched his gaze from my hair, looking me right in the eyes. Can I come over? He whispered again, almost daring me to let him. My hazel eyes blinked, twice, before my answer tumbled out of my mouth. What about Tiana? He laughed. It was a warm, solid laugh, the kind of laugh that makes you want to laugh with them. I smiled at his laugh. Tiana is my cousin. He laughed again, a bit gentler this time. She asked me to come because she was worried about me, his eyes roamed over my face and his tongue involuntarily licked his lips. I've been kind of down lately. My ex-girlfriend took everything from me, and I've been staying with Tiana while I sort out my living situation. She's been a godsend. My hopes flared up instantly. Tiana wasn't his girlfriend? He was single? This gorgeous man actually wanted to come home with me? I was gobsmacked then that would be... lovely. I fumbled, blushing again. By the time this night was over, I feared my face would be permanently bright red. His face lit up like it was Christmas, of course it was, and we waited together in the cold for the taxi to come take us to my place. And that was how we met. That was all five years ago. Five years of bliss. Of happiness. Of unconditional love, romance, and delight. There had been the occasional fight, of course. Did we want kids? Pets? Did Tom want to take the new job in Alberta? Could we afford a mortgage on a new home? But through it all, we stayed together, still loved each other, and never went to bed angry with each other. Until a week ago. A week ago Saturday it happened. I was in a car accident. Nothing too serious, the car was totaled but I only broke my right femur, and had a few bruises. When I woke up in the hospital, there was a strange man beside my bed. Hey. His voice sounded like sandpaper, or like he had been chain smoking cigarettes since he was ten. You okay, baby? He took my hand in his, and his palms were sweaty. I felt nauseated. Who are you? I asked, blinking my eyes rapidly. There was some grit in them from either the accident or sleeping. As my eyes cleared I started recognizing a few things about him. Honey, it's me, his voice was gentle, 
but not the voice I had gotten used to for the past five years. But his eyes were the same dazzling green as my Tom's. He had the same tilt to his chin, the same broadness of his shoulders. His lips were different, his voice and his nose were different too. Like someone had tried to make a copy of my Tom, but from a fuzzy picture of someone far away. The hair color was right, but instead of faded jeans and a t-shirt, he was wearing khakis and a crew neck. I'd never seen him in khakis in my life. And he was wearing sandals. My Tom didn't like sandals, saying they gave him weird tan lines. Babe? The worry in his eyes seemed genuine, but it scared me. Who was this guy? How did he know me? How did he even get in my room? Where was Tom I don't know you? Can you please leave? Can you get the nurse for me please? The pain in his eyes made me feel horrible. Like I'd kicked a puppy. But I knew that he wasn't the man I'd spent the last five years with. Sure, sweetheart, his voice was trembling, but he tried to put a brave face on. The nurse is right outside. I'm sorry, he scurried off to get the nurse before I could ask him what he was sorry for. She returned a few minutes later, taking my pulse, checking vitals and what not. Then she checked my head. There was a great big bandage around my head, that I hadn't even realized was there. As she unwound it, she began chatting with me. Your husband is waiting outside, until we're done here. He said you didn't recognize him. That's understandable. It happens sometimes when you've had a bad concussion. Amnesia is very tricky like that. She kept chattering, but my mind stopped listening. Amnesia. Is that what this was? The reason I felt like my husband was a completely different person? The reason I didn't recognize his face? His voice? His hands? I searched through my memories, and I remembered lots of other people. Angelica, Tiana, my neighbor Ms. Williams, her dog Sparky, they were all as clear as day to me. So why was I having such trouble with Tom? The nurse finished her check, and the man came back in the room. Tom. But not my Tom. A different Tom. A Tom who hadn't gotten a haircut two weeks ago. A Tom who had an unknown scar on his right eyebrow. A Tom who had a pierced ear. It was strange seeing all these differences, like someone had been given a description, and had gotten basic details right, but left out the really important things. This is scary. I'm afraid of what this could mean. Is my Tom gone forever? Am I stuck with fake Tom? Or will he magically reappear at some point, saying ha ha. Got you? Because I don't know if I'm going mad, or what. But this isn't my husband. But I'm afraid I'm still married to him. Story 9, Can You Survive Ghost Island? 30 days ago, I embarked on the journey of a lifetime. A while back, I saw an advertisement on the internet that a major television network was looking for people willing to participate in the biggest social experiment known to man, to drop everything and become a voluntary castaway on a deserted Pacific island. I'm sure we've all seen shows and movies about the concept before. Sixteen people were going to be chosen to be shipwrecked on an island, where they would compete against each other and vote each other out every week until only one remained. The last man standing would take home a million dollar prize. Can you survive Ghost Island? The advertisement taunted. When I saw the advertisement, I figured it had to be a scam, but curiosity got the best of me, and I clicked on the link. The source appeared to be reputable from a popular television network that had aired reality television shows of the like before. They didn't ask for any money as an application fee or anything, and all of the browser windows were protected and everything. Nothing immediately jumped out at me as being shady. Screw it, I thought to myself as I started typing my name in the application. There's no way in hell I'm going to get chosen, anyway, I'm sure thousands of people are going to apply. A chance to win a million dollars while lounging around on a beach all summer? I figured I was well suited for the challenge, based on what I had seen watching similar shows in the past. I thought I could be really good at this game, actually. So I decided it was worth a shot, and I submitted my application. Months went by, and I completely forgot about the whole thing, until one day, I received a letter in the mail from the network, a big envelope as if I had been accepted into college. 
I didn't even realize what it was at first, since I had completely forgotten that I had turned in that application. But as soon as I realized, my heart lurched. Had I actually been chosen? I ripped open that envelope, and sure enough, it was a letter of congratulations. I have been chosen to compete in the experiment, a show called Ghost Island. I excitedly broke the news to my family, who were completely shocked, given that I never told them about my random application. I never thought I would need to. I never in a million years thought I would actually be chosen. Thirty days ago, I packed my bags and left for the airport, where a representative from the network flew with me to Fiji. I couldn't stop myself from excitedly chattering at him the whole time, asking him all sorts of questions about the experience I was about to have on this mysterious island, but his only response was ever you'll have to wait and see. Everyone involved told me next to nothing about this experiment, from the congratulatory letter they sent to the flight with the rep. The whole process was shrouded in mystery, but I assumed that was part of the experiment. From Fiji, the representative guided me onto a helicopter, but this time, we didn't know the destination. The exact location of this deserted island was top secret. My excitement was quickly turning into nervousness, but as an adrenaline junkie, I was loving every minute of it. The helicopter dropped us off at the mysterious island, where I came face to face with the other castaways for the first time. The producers told us where to go, what to do, what colored bandana to put on our foreheads to symbolize the team we would be competing on. I got put on the purple team, along with seven others. The other team was the orange team. They said the whole experiment would last 30 days, but most of us would not still be there at the end of that 30 days. Every other day, one of us would be eliminated from the experiment and sent back home. I found out quickly that I was not nearly as well prepared for this game as I thought I was. Sure, watching other people do it on television makes it seem easy. But when you're trying to do these challenges, swimming through the ocean and digging in giant sand pits and traversing through obstacles on an empty stomach and no sleep, you learn really quickly that there is nothing you can do back home to actually prepare you for this game. After five days on the island, I was ready to call it quits. Food was scarce, whatever we could collect in the nearby jungle, and we were sleeping in a wooden shelter that left much to be desired. Every other day, we would have to wake up at the crack of dawn and walk miles to the challenge site, where we would be put through an arduous physical challenge. Whichever team lost that challenge would have to meet up the following day and vote on who they wanted to kick off their team and send home, majority rules. The days passed by slowly, and my body exhausted quickly. To be honest, even though I looked forward to this experience so much, when I got there and started living it, I realized quickly that I hated it. I hated every second of it. I couldn't wait to get back home to my family, to my mom's home-cooked meals, to my comfortable bed with pillows and blankets. Part of the reason why I missed home so much was because it seemed right away that my odds of winning that one million dollars were slim. Right away, I bonded with two guys on my tribe, their names were Matt and Lucas. We lost the second challenge of the game, but Matt, Lucas and I were confident that we were running things on the Purple Tribe, and that we weren't in danger of going home. We were three strong men, too, so the rest of the team would want to keep us around to help them win challenges. There were two other girls, Ashley and Devon, that we thought we had wrapped around our fingers. We talked about our plans around the campfire, and decided that another girl, Emily, would be our target the next night. Well, the next night came, and we all sat around the fire and cast our votes, and by a 5-3 decision, a blindsided Matt was the first person to be sent home from our team. Now Lucas and I knew that we weren't in such great positions, after all. We thought we had the numbers, but clearly, we were wrong. We had to do something, and fast, to stay alive in this game. Although knowing that my odds were slim, and knowing how exhausted and miserable I was on this island, part of me wondered if I should just quit while I was ahead. We lost the challenge the following morning, too. Lucas and I did everything we could to get numbers on our side, but for some reason, everyone else on the purple team wanted us gone. By a 5-2 vote, Lucas was the next one sent packing. Even though I knew I was really screwed at this point, I forced myself to stay in the game. 
After all, there was a million dollars on the line, and I could really use that million dollars. I wasn't about to give up until I had done everything in my power to win this game. So I spent the next few days tirelessly appealing to everyone on my tribe, telling them that I would be loyal to them in the game, that I would help them win challenges. If I could just survive one day at a time, maybe by the grace of God I could get myself to that last day. Today 30. 30 days ago, I embarked on the journey of a lifetime. I have not made it home yet. The morning after Lucas was sent home, the purple team pulled out an upset victory, and had a few days off where we didn't have to send anyone home. I tried to make the most of those days, getting to know the other people on my tribe, hoping that if I made them like me enough, they would want me to stick around, and they wouldn't vote me out. The next challenge, the purple team lost. By a 5-1 vote, they eliminated me from the experiment. That was 20 days ago. I was devastated as the producer led me away from my camp, from the rest of the purple tribe and helped me board the helicopter. He told me they would be taking me back to Fiji, where I would board the next flight home. He said sorry I didn't win, but he hoped I enjoyed myself and learned more about myself and my capabilities. I lied and said I had. We had only been in the air for about 30 minutes when the helicopter started losing altitude fast. Hold on, the pilot instructed us. Something's wrong. We're going down. In that moment, I was certain that I was going to die. And weirdly enough, the only thing I could think of was how mad I was at my teammates for voting me out, because if they hadn't done that, I wouldn't be dying. We were going down fast, we were going to crash land. But apparently, the pilot was a good one, and he kept his cool under pressure, and he managed to lower us down safely on another deserted island. I breathed a huge sigh of relief trying to calm my heaving chest and saying my obligatory thankful prayers as the pilot got out of the craft to inspect it. It seemed weird to me, that there was no smoke or anything, no visible sign of damage, but, hey, I was clearly no pilot. What did I know? I stepped out of the helicopter and shook out my trembling hands. I joked that the experiment was coming reality now, that it looked like we might actually be stuck on this deserted island. I asked the pilot what was wrong with the helicopter. He looked at me, the straightest face he could have, and told me there was nothing wrong with the helicopter what do you mean there's nothing wrong with it? I asked. Then why did we crash land on this island? And his response chilled me to the bone. When I close my eyes, I can still see that smirk on his face as he says it. Your game has just begun. Welcome to the real ghost island. He gestured behind me and I whirled around quickly, Matt. There's Matt, lying lifeless against a tree, blood and brains splattered against the sand with a gaping hole through his forehead. As I gawked at him, behind me, I heard a shotgun cocking. There's only one rule in Ghost Island, you have a 30 second head start. You'd better start running. I didn't think twice. I took off running as fast as my exhausted body could take me. 16 missing in Pacific Ocean. Reality show contestants left 30 days ago, network says it was a scam. Search and rescue operations underway. 16 adults are reported missing after allegedly departing for a fictional reality television show set somewhere in the Pacific Islands, officials say. Family and those close to the missing say the contestants received correspondence from a major television network inviting them to participate in a social experiment in which they voluntarily strand themselves on a deserted island for a cash prize. The network says such correspondence never occurred, adding on that they recently finished filming an official season of a similar show, starring 16 different contestants. It is unclear at this time who sent this fake correspondence but officials are reviewing the letters sent to the contestants. The Federal Bureau of Investigation and related intelligence organizations have checked the location where these letters say the fake show was to be filmed, but found no traces of any of the missing. Family members of the missing informed law enforcement officials of the situation when, after the 30 days specified in the letters, none of the contestants returned home. Contestants had been promised a $1 million dollar prize to be awarded to the winner. Flight records show that all 16 contestants flew to Fiji, where they were to take helicopters to the show site. 
Officials in Fiji say the contestants did arrive 30 days ago, but they do not know where they went next. Domestic law enforcement and intelligence officials are conducting searches throughout the Pacific Islands for the missing, but have not returned any information at this time. Anyone with information on the matter is encouraged to contact the FBI at 1-800-225-5324. Story 10, I don't know why he did it. I don't know exactly why he did it. I mean, it's not like I'm supposed to know. The news has kept the details away from the public, and Gil Henningsen was a classmate, nothing more. When I first heard the news, I wasn't even saddened. My immediate thought was, I forgot to give him his pencil back. As it usually goes with these sorts of things, the community mourned. In a small town like ours, a loss like this can seem monumental. Grief counselors set up temporary stations in the school library, and teachers informed us that we could visit one at any time during the school day, no questions asked. Just raise your hand, ask to leave. Deal with this the best you can. But while the town felt a communal sadness, high school students, individually and in small groups, have wickedness in them. Maybe wickedness is the wrong word, but I don't know how else to describe it. A spectrum, morbid curiosity on one end, complete apathy on the other end. Kids who didn't know him used his passing to their advantage. The curious would seek an answer to the question that pervaded the student body's thoughts so they could proudly provide the information to their friends, and the apathetic would ask to see the counselors and instead go to their cars to vape and hit up naive freshman girls for nudes on Snapchat. I'm not sure where I was on the spectrum. Somewhere in the middle, I think. I wanted to know how he did it, but not to gossip. It's not like I had anyone to tell, anyway. High school hadn't been good to me, the social food chain had left me friendless, at the same time, I couldn't bring myself to care that he was gone. GoFundMe pages took over my Facebook feed, asking me and others in town to donate towards Gill's funeral, various community memorials, mental health awareness groups. Gill's friends and people who pretended they knew him posted essay-length comments on his old Instagram posts, complete with RIP buddy and gone too soon and red heart emojis. Fucking emojis. God, my classmates were shallow. I couldn't stand to see it. I unfollowed him. But it just didn't matter. He was fucking dead, and that was that. Pretending that we were friends just because his old purple mechanical pencil was still in my backpack would be stupid. We weren't friends. We weren't fucking friends since middle school, and I don't know if we were even friends back then. I'd go over to his place every Saturday night, and we'd play Mario Kart and eat pizza rolls until 2 in the morning. I'd listen to him talk about Fay Marks until my ears bled, I helped him do his algebra homework almost every week, and I taught him not to use too much axe. I did everything for him, and he still abandoned me for cooler friends once we hit high school. And now he's dead, and all I care about is how he did it. What's done is done. I don't care that he's gone. I don't have time to care that he's gone. I have to figure out how he did it. They're gonna get suspicious if they can't find a cause of death soon. Maybe I should have made it more obvious, swung him from his ceiling by his bedsheets or stuffed some of my pills down his throat. But no, I had to be a fucking dumbass and forget to leave the knife. They're gonna want to know how he managed to slit his throat without any apparent weapon. The only reason they even suspect suicide is because of the last minute note I left. I know. Maybe he slit his throat and then, in a last minute dying spasm, threw the knife across the room and behind the bed. Does that happen? Are dying spasms a thing? God, I hope so. I don't really have any other option. Okay. Okay, that's what I'll do. I'll go in through the window, same way I did when I needed to borrow a pencil, and I'll tuck the knife in between the bed and the wall. It'll have to work. I know how he did it now, thank God. I can stop obsessing over that. I don't think I'll ever have to figure out why. The note was vague enough, and nobody ever really knows with suicide, do they? Besides, it's not like I'm supposed to know. Gil and I were classmates. Nothing more. Story 11, The Lazarus Experiment. I'm an antique stealer. It's a job that pays the bills, 
but most of the time I come across incredibly boring and often ugly things that I can buy cheap and turn a profit on. Throughout my career I've found a few strange artifacts, and I've made some decent contacts that will help me discover lost items, for a share of the profit of course. Sometimes I'll even get called to different counties, which is fine because I quite like to experience new cultures, and see what weird things people leave behind there. That being said, recently I've come across a pile of documents that all describe something called the Lazarus Experiment, and while I'm still waiting to find out its authenticity, I thought I might as well share it with you fine people. So below are a few entires that I picked out, I'm not exactly sure what to make of them. November 10th, Day Zero. I've always been a man of few words, but this past week has been so full of peculiar events, I've finally decided to keep a journal. Even if never read by anyone, my thoughts will still exist on paper, an oddly comforting thought. Currently I'm being moved to a secret facility. They've told me it's some sort of bunker situated deep underground, one where I can finally realize my full scientific potential. Seeing as I'm in the back of a covered truck, not being able to see outside, I can only say we've traveled for about 12 hours at this point. It all escalated so suddenly earlier today, when the state decided that I can be of some help to their cause. Unrest has been on the rise lately around the country, and everyone knows in their heart that war is inevitable. Honestly, I've never been into politics. I consider myself to be apolitical, and I believed the rumors were exaggerated. At least I did until last night when vandals broke into the university building, where they completely wrecked havoc upon my office and left obscenities on the walls, several slurs and warnings to get out of town. I cannot fathom why they hate me so much, I am a simple physicist with some slight unconventional ideas. As I entered my office this morning to clean what remained, I was approached by two men in shiny new military uniforms. At first I was confused as to why they were with the military and not the police. I naturally assumed they were there to question me about the events that had transpired the night before, but they showed no interest in that. I have to say, they were extraordinarily polite young men. The military usually treated people like myself with much less respect. These men, however, treated me as an equal. The older of the two was a man of higher rank in the military. He told me my work was well known to them, and that I had a unique opportunity to serve my country, not on the front, nor on any battlefield, but in a state-of-the-art laboratory. I couldn't say no to such an offer. I have learned throughout my life that denying the state is a bad idea. Those who do, are oftentimes taken away never to be seen again. Time and discretion was at the essence, meaning I would have to leave with them immediately. I demanded to see my family, but they simply told me to write a letter and they would ensure that my wife received it. My dearest Leah. I have been requested by the state due to my research. I wish I could tell you this in person, however our country is no longer safe. We all know war is coming. Everyone has to contribute to protect those we love, even if not on the battlefield. It is a great honor, but I leave you with a heavy heart and longing in my soul. I will be back soon enough to see our son take his first step. I think we should name him Adam, maybe I will even be there for his birth. I love you always. Yours truly. Elotzar. I will finish my first entry here, the driver says we will arrive shortly. November 12th, Day 2. I've been guided throughout the facility today. There are 12 floors all underground, but I will remain confined to the 4th floor. I have never seen such sophisticated equipment, and with it I can finally prove my theories. The director of this facility is a military man, an aged soul like myself, but still as strong as ever. He has been put in charge of monitoring the work happening here. The name will be the Lazarus Experiment, a bit grandiose for my taste, but I will happily follow orders after being given this gift. Another thing which I found quite odd was my new, fake name. The director said it was for my own safety, as this work should never be linked to any of us. So from here on out, I will call myself Peter, as long as I remain on the premises. November 17th, Day 7. For the past five days I've attempted to explain the physics behind my project. During the meetings I got the feeling that none of them like me very much, all except for the director, who managed to convince them all to have faith in me. 
He said my experiments were essential to our cause. It's quite simple actually, I told them. I do not wish to alter reality, but rather to create a rift through time itself, and bring people to our time just mere moments before their deaths. By doing this they will live, but events from the past will not change at all, because they are taken away, rather than being killed. Of course this requires some knowledge about when and where they died, which limits the capabilities of the machine I will build, but nonetheless, it will change the course of history. In a few days the director will grant me full control over the fourth floor, with a crew of 17 to help me conduct my research. June 22nd, day 955. It has been almost three years since I entered this wretched facility. On the way we have faced so many setbacks I almost lost faith. The thought of being without my family rendered my mind useless, I just wanted to see them once, but my superiors refused me that privilege. By now my son has been born, I've missed his first words and first steps. I just hope he's healthy. I've also overheard some chatter. The director has mentioned another project on several occasions. It has just been a whisper here and there, but they call it Operation Barbarossa. No matter, I know the war is raging, and many lives have been claimed. Soon my machine prototype will be ready. Maybe then will we end the war, and I can finally see my beloved family again. November 3rd, day 1089. It worked, it finally worked. My machine, my theories, I was right. Last evening we decided, after months of planning, to finally try out our prototype. On our first attempt we would not bring back any more than seven subjects, all from the front lines of the battle. Our goal was to monitor their reaction from being brought back from the dead. Every superior, including the director, was present during our first and most important test. I was honored to flip the switch, and I smiled excitedly as I did. A part of me worried that the machine would not be able to handle the vast force we put on it. That alone is unlike anything ever created in our world. The pylons started rotating at an accelerating rate, quickly reaching as much as 10,000 rotations per minute. The machine held together gracefully as a bright blue light shot out from its core, illuminating our anticipating faces. We stood in silence for 10 minutes, the light increasing in intensity for each passing second. Soon it was too much to look at directly, as if staring at a brilliant blue sun. Suddenly seven small portals appeared scattered around the laboratory, they were dormant for a few minutes, but then out of nowhere one man fell from each portal. Their bodies slumped down on the ground where they lied silently. My crew ran over to check on their vitals. Sure enough, they were all alive, but unconscious. Upon looking at their IDs we could confirm their identities. All had died in the same battle, although not knowing each other. Now they were by our side, unscathed from the war. It's an achievement that will be remembered for millennia to come. No longer will wives lose their husbands to battle, no longer will children have to grow up without a father. We. I have saved them all. November 10th, day 1096. Each man we brought back remained asleep for about a week, but this morning they all awoke almost simultaneously. At first not a single one uttered a word to us, they remained awake, but completely unresponsive to our inquiries. We prodded them and shook them, but nothing happened until exactly three hours after their awakening. The first man we interviewed spoke of his death. He had been shot in his chest, which punctured a lung. Despite his injury he couldn't bleed out, his blood had frozen on the cold battlefield, leaving him to gasp for air until he finally froze to death. He had died alone without anyone to comfort him during his last moments on earth. It was impossible, if my machine worked correctly he would be brought back just before that fatal gunshot, yet he remembered the events surrounding his death. The man knew he should be dead, but didn't appear shocked or at all surprised to be sitting with us without a single scratch. He was calm, but also anhedonic, joyless. Tonight I'll sleep uneasy. This experiment no longer feels like a hopeful attempt at saving lost souls. Something sinister lurks in the portals of the dead. December 12th, day 1128. I'm finally beginning to realize the magnitude of my mistake. It has now been approximately one month since the first subjects awoke. 
I cannot bring myself to call them human anymore, not after what I've seen them do. They are simply no longer who they used to be. When asked whether they would continue the war effort, they seemed unafraid and careless about any harm that might occur, even though they already experienced the pain of death. They have lost their most basic human instinct, to stay alive. They are all dead now, all save for a single soldier we have isolated in a padded cell, a place where he is unable to hurt himself. It's our own fault of course, we failed to monitor them at every hour of the day. Three of the seven subjects hung themselves in their rooms, two others repeatedly smashed their heads against the wall until their skulls cracked, and the final subject somehow got a hold of a gun. The last one haunts me the most. He had a gun but chose not to shoot himself in the head. Instead he opted to shoot himself in the gut, firing all eight rounds of the pistol. It took him two hours to bleed out, and through it all he never spoke a word, just stared at us as we tried to help him, emptiness filling his eyes. Despite this major setback, the director is still confident in our cause. He claims with modifications we can fix the machine, and bring back healthy subjects to fight in our war. September 8, day 1763. As time goes on I have almost forgotten the feeling of sunlight warming my skin, or the face of my beautiful wife. She was always too good for me, a monster like myself doesn't deserve any pity or salvation. It has been almost two years since our first batch of people were brought back from their deaths. Since then I have modified my machine to bring back a much larger scale of soldiers. 23,154, a number I will never allow myself to forget. That is the number of soulless men I have helped bring back. Men that were immediately sent to one of the two fronts we are currently fighting on. I can't imagine the horrors of fearless soldiers fighting without a cause, not longing for love nor freedom. Even in such a large number it's hopeless, war has no winner. I pleaded repeatedly with the director to shut the project down. I told him the Lazarus experiment was a pointless way of prolonging death, that these men were no longer human, but he was adamant that we continue, and I follow orders, in fear of what will happen to my family if I don't. June 6, day 2035 The war is lost. Were drunken yells that echoed through the hallways of the facility. The director stumbled across the concrete floor, almost shattering his bottle of wine against the wall. The other superiors quickly escorted him away. Me and my crew were kept in separate rooms while the superiors assessed the situation. After a few hours of waiting in anticipation, a guard entered my room and announced that the experiment was over. I was relieved to say the least. After more than five years I would finally be able to go home and see my family. I asked to see the director one last time to say farewell and thank him for the opportunity. I do not look up to him as much these days, but he served his country like I did, and for that he deserves my respect. The director was sobering up when I met him, still a bit worn out from the alcohol, but clear enough to speak his mind. He told me I was a great scientist that should have gotten much more out of life than I did. He told me he was sorry, but that he not choice but to send me away, he even shook my hand before I left. I wouldn't be going home. The superiors told me it was due to the war. They said I would be sent to a camp where my family was waiting for me, the only place that was still safe for people like myself. It doesn't really matter where I go, as long as I can see my wife and son. I wonder if he will even know who I am after all these years. I wonder what my wife has told him about me. I've never heard of the place I'm heading. The guards call it Auschwitz, I hope it's nice.